Hello and welcome to Aspire Church Manchester. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. If you stick around at the end, we'll give you more information about our ministry. But for now, enjoy the preaching. Six, please. Ephesians chapter six. We're going to start at verse 10. We've been kind of going over this the last few weeks. Uh, I want to remind you that three weeks ago we preached to you Choose to be a champion, where we talked about how this world is trying to uh, convince us to think like they think, to have the same morals that they have, and to kind of twist the morals that the Bible teaches us about. It's a battle against opinions. You remember we learned about that. Two weeks ago, we taught you about things to know about the devil, because the devil's real. He's not all-powerful, and he has limitations, but nevertheless, he can cause severe destruction if we're unaware of his presence in our lives. So it's important that you know about the enemy. It is. It is. We don't magnify him, but we don't ignore him either. And if you need more info on that, you can go on the podcast and Download that message there or two or something else maybe you've heard. That's always available for you. But to this morning, I want to continue along that line of thinking. I was so blessed when our sister was talking about using a weapon of worship against the devil. And uh, uh, we'll talk about that next week. It'll be our final, ser- uh, final chapter in this collection of messages that we've been looking at. So uh, I want to teach you today about the deadly battle, the deadly battle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13 is the whole passage. We're not going to read it all at once, but we'll go through it little by little. For those who are spiritually alert, any day can be a battle, any day. You just never know when the devil's going to rise up and say, today's the day I'm engaging you. You just don't know. And for some of us, every day can include some battle. It can. Every day can include some battle. You might not see it equally, but it happens. We live in an age of antichrist thinking. It used to be when you, this was many years ago, well before my time, when you could go to work and people talked about church. They talked about praising God. Uh, Leaders of businesses would talk about how God was blessing them and God was involved in their life. You don't hear that nowadays. We are in an age of intense unrighteousness. The things that are called acceptable are completely unacceptable to God. And yet we're praising them in our media as we discussed three weeks ago. We have a darkness, and you all know this, A darkness that presses on our doorstep daily. Daily, it's on our door. It's knocking on our door. Sometimes it's, uh, I don't think you have, maybe you have them here. In L.A., they've been around for a long time. Batter rams, where they take the cops, come in, and they batter ram your door down to arrest you. Well, I want to tell you, the devil batter rams your house from time to time and sometimes often. We families, and sometimes our churches, are spiritual war zones. Did you know that? It's true. It's true. We ignore that sometimes to our peril, but yet it's absolutely true. And it's not the only time in history that this has happened. We've been studying Revelation. We're talking about the church at Pergamos, the church of Pergamum, some people translate it. But the Pergamene people were living in a place that was called where Satan dwells where Satan's throne was, so they understand exactly what we're talking about today. The question is, do we? Do we get it? Do we recognize uh, this deadly battle that we're opposed in? I said I wasn't going to read the whole passage, but I think I'm going to. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10. You know, Ephesians is an interesting book. If you read the first chapter, it talks all about the glories of salvation. The second chapter talks about how to be saved by grace through faith. 
the third chapter and fourth chapter deal with Christian living and the convictions that we should have as believers. Uh, the fifth chapter uh, speaks about Christian family and Christian marriage. And here we come to the sixth and final chapter. And we're even coming to the final bit that Paul wants to get across to the Ephesians. How many know when someone says, here's my final words, I hope I don't die in a fiery crash somewhere where I can't say some final words to my kids. I don't want that to be my final words, you know, like, well, you should have cleaned your room when you were a kid, you know. But here Paul is able to say, finally, in verse 10, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. How are we to be in the Lord? So are we to be weak in the Lord, half-hearted in the Lord, uncaring in the Lord, uh, not mindful in the Lord? No. Strong. Strong. You need to say that every day. You may say, well, I feel weak. Too bad. Too bad. Sorry, I love you, but let me speak truth to you here today. Too bad. Strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. A quick prayer, please. Heavenly Father, I come before you today, Lord, asking God that you would be glorified, magnified, lifted up, and your good news would be spread. I pray today as I share your word, Lord, that the enemy would be driven far from this place. God, for those who have entangled themselves with the affairs of this life, I pray repentance upon them and that they would make decisions that would benefit their walk with you. God, let not one leave this place without being touched by your Holy Ghost. Uh, God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Throughout history, Britain has been known as a very tough country. The British Bulldogs and Americans always looked up to Brits and the things that they've done uh, in the past. Always a nation of tough people. But yet, a long time ago, the Vikings struck fear into the hearts of the British. The Vikings were known as very tough individuals uh, and they prayers were made in churches and they prayed to God, uh, God deliver us from the fury of the Northmen. They were uh, tenacious. It was their swiftness to engage in battle. It was unmatched by any other opponent that any of the British population had ever faced. And when they did finally engage, they fought with such energy and such ferocity that it took everyone back and everybody ran. It was just so much to, in deal, to deal with that some even thought that the Vikings were not even human. That's how powerful they were. And so I believe, and I propose to you today, that we as believers are in a similar type of battle uh, in our lives. I think we're in what I like to call the war of ferocious energy. I want you to recognize that uh, today. The level of intensity is often missed by people we don't realize and recognize the intensity of the enemy and the drive and the determination that he has uh, to destroy. And the question is, why? Why? I think it's found in our text. And I think in our text we uh, uh, find why we sometimes are lackadaisical and kind of miss the, miss the mark when it comes to this battle because we judge the battle by what we can see, what we can see. It's a nice, bright, sunny day. All must be well with my soul. Man, I've got a pocket full of cash and more on the way. Things are looking up. Man, my kids actually did their homework, got up early for school, and cleared the dishes when I told them to. Man, things are really starting to change. 
we start to have this mindset because we judge only by what we can see. But the Bible says in our text, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. People are not what oppose us. And so sometimes that's why we miss the ferocity of the devil because it's in the spirit realm in which he's moving and opposing us. I know you already know this. You know this. You've heard messages. You've read this passage how many times? But you know why? Because it's hard to focus on the true enemy. It really is. And that's why we have to recognize what it's saying here. The real battle is taking place not with people, but in heavenly places. In heavenly places. The unseen spiritual realm. Can I tell you the make or break issues of your life today are spiritual? They're not your marriage. They're not your kids. They're not how much money you're making or not making. It's not the economy. It's not who's in power. It's not the government. It's not what's happening overseas. It's none of that. It's happening in the spirit realm. (laughs) Athletics and academics are not your kid's most problematic issue. There's something happening behind the scene. Parent, do you see it? Parent, do you recognize it? Of course we deal with those things. But behind do we see that see your financial issues are not the most valuable things in your life you think well if I just get my business up and going man things are going to be grand well I'll really be rocking then you know I'll get a couple of different franchises going and get some money coming in here move abroad and get some things happening over there everything will be Jim dandy can I tell you that's fantasy Even if you had all those things, you could be losing the ferocity of the battle because we wrestle against unseen spiritual opponents. Are you with me here today? Stick with me. I'm taking you somewhere. Hope you're on this train because it's leaving the station. (laughs) See, the most critical issues of our life are battled in the spirit because the eternal things are spiritual things. You're not going to take your your car into heaven. I love my car, but I can't take it into heaven. You're not going to take those nice clothes, ladies, or that new uh, hairdo that you had done or that bank account. God's not going to care one iota about that. What you're going to take up there is the spiritual things, the spiritual things. So with that being said, the enemy is out to steal, right? Kill and what? Destroy. Destroy, right? We know that. So what is it that he's out trying to steal? What is he trying to destroy? I'm going to get him to crack up his car, you know. I'm going to get someone to come key that new paint job, and then I'll get him. Come on. That's not what he's after. He's after your soul. He's after your spiritual things, that joy that is so powerful and so important to your walk, to your life. Can you say amen? amen? And so with that being said, we need to look at, secondly, the nature of the battle, the nature of this battle that we're fighting. This guy is a a Senegalese wrestler. He's from Senegal. Apparently in Senegal, wrestling on the beach is a big thing. I never heard about it, but I read an article about it. And this guy wanted his picture taken to be shown how powerful and strong and his ability to, inability to be defeated you know, and uh, that is the kind of thing that you and I are opposing. The Bible says we do not wrestle. Say wrestle. wrestle. See, this is how the battle is. This is how the struggle is. The enemy is not launching missiles into your life. He's not lobbing bombs into your home. He just doesn't shoot things from afar off. Neither can you engage him by doing that from an air-conditioned room. It's an up-close and personal battle. It's something that gets in your face. When I was growing up, I played basketball. It was one of the sports that I liked and Basketball was well popular. It's kind of like maybe like football is here. You know, it's like all the cool guys played basketball or tried to be cool. Basketball was a thing. I had a friend who was a wrestler. And I remember telling him, like, man, dude, you ought to play ball with us. You know, what you do is for 
I use some words that I can't use in church, but the bottom line was I didn't think much of wrestling. He says, come on, let's, let's wrestle. Let's wrestle. We get down on the ground, and he put his hand on my belly button. I said, hey, watch it, bro. And he had his hand on my belly button, his other one on my arm. He flipped me in no time, man. And I had him by a lot of weight, and I had him by a lot of size. But yet he was able to beat me because he was up close and personal. And I'm, he goes, arm bar. He goes, do you still think this is a weak sport? I remember thinking like, whoa, this is something. The enemy wrestles us. He wrestles. We struggle in this manner. Understand that the enemy is not going to stand off and not invade your space. He's going to invade your space. (laughs) It's not easy to live in war, but I want to tell you, you can't opt out. You can't opt out. He's coming after you whether you like it or not. (laughs) It's up to you to decide how you're going to engage or not. Secondly, the enemy is scheming. Everybody say scheming, scheming. To wipe us out. That's how he works. He wrestles us and he uses scheme. Put on the whole armor of God, verse 11 says, that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. Now, in regard to this armor that we're putting on, let's just take a minute and let you know that that is a word that, uh, it's a phrase, put on, that deals with permanence. In other words, put it on and don't take it off. Some of you have kids that you tell them, put on your, your, your coat, you know, put on your coat, it's cold outside. And they put the, you put the coat on and then all of a sudden you see them outside and they've taken their coat off, thrown it off onto the side and they've got no coat. And you're out there, put your coat on and don't take it off. Any parents talk like that? <laughs> You know, sometimes I watch these old movies about how people were strong with their kids. I go, man, you'd get arrested for that nowadays, you know. (laughs) Put your coat on, don't take it off. That's what God is saying about the armor. Put it on, don't take it off, because just because you fought a battle yesteryear doesn't mean you're not going to fight one this day. Recognize with me today that the armor is something that has to be on at all times, at all times. And the goal, the goal of the full armor is to stand, to stand. Now, if you were going to stand, Calvin, could you just stand? See how he stood? You can sit down now, bro. That's good. See, that, that, that was just kind of like standing. That's not how the word is. It's not that kind of standing. Not the kind of standing that we do. Stand means stance. Take a stance. So when you put on the full armor of God, it's saying, I'm ready. I'm prepared. Engage me. Engage me. I'm not just standing. Hit me. I'm back. No, it's try something, punk. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I get in these warfare modes and I've got this ghetto that comes out of me sometimes that probably shouldn't. But the point is, standing is not a passive thing. It's a militant stance. And why, why, is, it, why is it that we have to be so militant? Why? why? Why do we have to have that militant stance? It's because the enemy is crafty and he's cunning and he uses things to deceive us and to trick us and to flip us up. And before we know it, whoa, he's got us. How many times has that happened to you? Man, I'm standing strong. Before you know it, you're on your back going, Daddy. Right? And that's why we have to have such a militancy about our spirit, about our attitude. Uh, uh, Just a little side note, I believe church services should be a bit militant. I believe Christians should gather together like a war rally, you know, and give God high praise, make shouts to God and receive from God and see because without the full armor we lose ground in our personal struggles because we're facing a what we call a demonic horde a huge amount of demonic uh, uh, beings Revelation chapter 12 speaks of the enemies the fallen angels like stars in the skies 
That's how innumerable they are. And uh, there's been some Bible scholars who say there's more demons than people on the planet. Now, we can't prove that, but I can believe that from reading Scripture. One thing I can tell you is that there's a lot of them, and we can't ignore them. We can't just pretend like, oh, they're, they're over there. They're over there. I want to tell you that what we can prove is that they're organized and strategic. Organized. They're an organized enemy. They are not just sitting around saying, let's have a cup of tea, you know. Let's just hang out and have a chit-chat. The Bible calls them principalities and powers, rulers of darkness and spiritual hosts of wickedness. That tells us what they're, what it's all about. Let's just leave, leave it like that. Smarter men than me say that this means that they have assignments. They have assignments. There's like, hey, you're going to go and take care of this, and you're going to go take care of that. I've been a kind of a World War II buff. I almost hate saying it because it was a horrific, horrific war that took place in the 40s here that America was involved in, Europe was involved in, England was under great threat. By the grace of God, we're free today. And so I've studied the war. And I got to tell you, they just didn't keep lobbing people into different areas. There was great strategy there, an organization to be able to win and have victory. The devil is just like that. Some say they even have geographical assignments, certain devils in certain places on the globe. And I don't know if that's true either, but I do see certain sins more prevalent in certain areas. The country you were born in might have different sins than the country that you live in now. You see these different sinful things. So it makes sense to me that there is some geographical assignment of evil uh, towards this. Whatever the case is, we have to recognize uh, that he's trying, the devil is trying uh, to overtake us, and he has assignments against your home. He knows your address. He has assignments against our church, not only our church, but every church, but let's just say our church here. And I want to tell you something. He's never late for church. He's always here on time. All the saints of God might not be on time, but he's on time. He's waiting for you. When you arrive, he goes, (laughs) you think he's battling you to get here. I'm here to tell you that's just you. (laughs) What happens is when you do get here, he wants to stop you. He wants to stop you receiving and experiencing and fighting back. He's organized. He's got a legion opposition against you and I. Satan works in the shadows of people's lives, waiting, listen to this, for the right time to pounce. He knows they're weak, they're vulnerable, I can get them. You say, well, I didn't even know, man, I didn't even feel, I was just totally unexpected, I didn't even think that this was going to happen. Yeah, no kidding. What do you think? He's just going to tell you, hey, you know what, on March 3rd, I'm coming after you. No, he's not going to do that. He lays low until the exact right time. He's patient. When America was assaulted by foreign terrorists, domestic terrorists as well, one of the things that they said on 9-11-2001, they said, you know, the enemy against us against Americans, is patience, patient. It's not exposing themselves. They'll wait for the right time. They'll wait. And they found out that the ones who committed all the atrocities had been in the country for years doing this, right under the noses of the American officials. The point being is that Satan works just like that. He's just sitting in your life waiting for you. You know, that thing you've been toying with and that lack of commitment that God's been dealing with you over and over and over again. Well, 
be prepared. I'm saying this with love. I'm your pastor. I'm your shepherd. I'm your, your uh, in a sense, fatherly to you. I care about you. But I have to tell you, I can't stop the enemy for you. I can't do it. I would if I could. It's up to you to recognize how he works and how he operates. Waits for just the right time to push that button. It sounds so sinister, doesn't it? And so maybe right now you're asking, well, pastor, I see your point. I see your point. Can you tell me what tactics that the enemy is going to use against my life? Well, I'm kind of glad you asked. And sure, I'll help you out this morning. So Satan's tactic, how does he move against us? One man said it was threefold. I like what he said, and I'm going to share it with you. He said, first of all, he moves in disguise. Disguise. Remember, two weeks ago, we talked about how the the, the devil comes as an angel of light. Do you remember we talked about that? Can I tell you something? He's not really an angel of light. (laughs) That's not what he is. He's cheating. He's lying. He just pretends like he's good. He's acting out. You know, I, I, I've, one thing I've learned pastoring for a few decades now, I've learned it's shocking how people can say one thing and do another. They act like they're this, and then you find out they're really that. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But you think about that. The devil's worse. He's worse. He's a master of disguise. So let me give you five common, simple ways that Satan uses disguise to hurt us. First way is he makes little things look big. Little problems, he blows them out of proportion and makes them big problems. Big problems. That's his, his strategy. That little argument that you had, it's nothing. Small. But before you know it, it's like a major deal. It's a big deal. It's huge. It's what happens. It's what happens. Little things become big because Satan disguises them. The opposite is true. He makes big things and makes them come across as if they're little. Ah, church, not important. Prayer, yeah, you can do it tomorrow. Hey, don't worry about giving. It's not important. Hey, it's all right. If, you know, the Holy Spirit talked to you to speak to that person, but he'll speak to you again. You know, just wait till another time. And he takes this big thing and minimizes it. It makes it a small thing, and it's not a small thing. It's a big thing. He disguises. It's how he works. Now, I know many of you already know this, but I'm reminding you because we forget third thing he does is he gets us to care about tomorrow today you know the bible says we have enough trouble for today to not worry about tomorrow but you know what you end up doing because i do it so i know you do it is i end up like focused on tomorrow focus on what's going to happen oh what might happen if this person does that or if my uh, friend doesn't change here or if my job goes out of business or how am I going to get ahead how am I going to do that and you miss everything that's going on today see it's a strategy of Satan that's how he disguises things he makes tomorrow bigger than today fourth one is just like that but opposite Spend too much time thinking about yesterday. What was it like? What was yesterday? I remember. You know, one thing about getting older, it's it's not a good thing. I guess I was going to say it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing. It's not a good thing. And one of the things is that you remember a lot because you have a past, right? When you're 25, you don't have much past. When you're 35, you're starting to get a little past. When you're 55, man, you've got some past. If you're older than that, well, bro, you got a lot, man, let me tell you. (laughs) (laughs) sorry bro (laughs) but the bottom line is you can sit and think about a lot of things and you have a lot of memories good and bad but your mind doesn't really recognize what they were really like and you tend to think boy things were good in the good old days and things are like that and you can tend to be like that man I remember when we used to have church you know, I remember when God was really moving. There were, men were men and women were women. And you can get like that. You're thinking about yesterday. 
Sometimes it's the opposite of that when you're thinking about yesterday. It's a weight. Man, all the things I've been through, all the hurt, the pain, all the, the devastation, man. I remember when my kids were small and they were so cute and so loving, so kind. They had such great big dreams and now they're just shattered. It's a wilderness of heartbreak now for me. You can begin to look at it like that and Satan disguises the, us. It disguises himself, rather, getting us to spend too much time on yesterday. Now, there's the fifth one, and it's probably the most important out of all of them. Are you ready? Ready for the fifth way he disguises? He gets us to live apart from God's word. And this right here is probably the crux of the issue here today, to be honest. Because when we read God's word and we look at our lives, they often don't line up. And oftentimes we discard God's word and just live our lives. I read my Bible today. I'm good. Now I'm just going to live my life. I'll try to be a good boy, a good girl. But when the Bible tells us that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, that doesn't mean sometimes. That means right now when you're under this heavy assault, greater is he that's in you. Greater is he that's in you. Do you believe that? But he gets us to live apart from God's word. It's why you have so much trouble reading. You know, you never have trouble watching television or going to the gym or, well, maybe you do going to the gym, some of you. Uh, but you don't have trouble. Uh, I, I doubt any of you have, have missed a uh, dinner call. You know, we have dinner at 6 p.m. Make sure you're here at 6 p.m. You're here at 5.59, you know, ready for dinner. You want that meal, right? Someone says, hey, I'm going to treat you. We'll meet down at the donut place, and we'll have some of those good Canadian donuts, and we're going to have a good time, and we'll have coffee. Boy, you're there. You can't wait. You don't forget that. But when it comes to the Word of God, I'll catch up tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Because the enemy disguises us, and disguises himself, and gets us to live apart from God's Word. So the first tactic, we spent a lot of time on it, was disguise. Everybody say disguise. Second one is divide. Divide. See, what he does is he goes and he takes small things, as we've said, and makes them big things and then begins to divide. And he just tries to to get in there, just tries to get in and begin to split people apart you know he, he he just like tries to come and tries to like move on in move on in that's how he does see gets in there and he goes hey hey he goes hey she she don't care about you he's never going to change this is how it is and he's in there and he's just causing division now, how many know this lovely woman this young lad They should be together, should be together. Division, it's what he does. He sits on the shoulder of each one that he's causing division with and speaks opposite things to each one. Happens all the time, happens all the time, but we don't recognize it. We just think that's the way they are. We just think that's the way they are. Division, division, division. I've got to tell you that the Bible is filled with this. We see Way back with Adam and Eve and God. Adam and Eve were separated from God. Division. I want to cause division. God says this. You walk in the cool of the day with the Lord and things are just perfect and things are happening. Division. You see Job. He was there. He had these lifelong friends. But as soon as the devil hit under God's allowance, man, those friends division. The devil got in and caused division. You can read about the Uh, apostles in the New Testament, Timothy, Paul, Silas, divisiveness that came over small issues uh, that caused division amongst these great men, leaders of God, Ananias and Sapphira and the church. They loved their church. They were part of the church. They were involved in the church, but then they lied to their church. (laughs) Division, division, division. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just feel like I have to say this, uh, that it's heartbreaking when 
there's divisiveness between leaders of the church and people of the church. It's just, it's just, it's just heartbreaking, heartbreaking. I, I'm thinking through the years of being a, a leader of the church as a pastor and before as a pastor, you know, any little quirk of my personality or Gracie's personality, any smudge on one of our character, the enemy will use it to divide me, us, you from each other. If that same thing happened in one of your friends, you'd overlook it. If one of your friends did what the pastor did to you, no big deal, I overlook it, I forgive, I forget, it's no big deal. But the pastor, the, the first lady, my God, they should know better. Can I tell you something? No doubt that pastors, leaders of churches, uh, people who are leaders over ministry must live to a higher standard. I am not denying that one bit. We, we definitely need to be that. We need more of that in the world in which we live in. But the standard cannot be so high that they can't live it out. It cannot be so high that you couldn't live it if you were in that position. And then the point that I'm trying to make is that the goal of the enemy is division, division, division. Wants to make that real. The third tactic of the enemy is to destroy John chapter 10, verse 10 speaks about the enemy. You all quoted it perfectly. Steal, kill, destroy. Comes to bring total devastation. The word destroy is not just like crumble or push you off your chair or knock you back a little bit. It's talking about eradication. That's his goal is to eradicate you. And it doesn't take a master theologian to see that he concentrates on two particular areas in the world. One is the home, the home, family, marriages, kids, parents, all the home. Because when the home is strong, the world is strong. Every nation where the home has broken down, that has lost their power. People think it's military might. People think of the United States as some powerful because it's military might and all of that. You know what the best thing that America had going and they're losing it fast is this idea of home and family that is now being dispersed. In our country, we see that as well. The only reason it's being built up is because of those of us that are coming from other places are being able to bring some of that back. But the point being is that the devil takes aim to destroy homes and family. So if you say, well, man, my kids, my husband, my wife, this problem is because he's taking aim. Second thing, again, don't take a, a miracle worker to understand this, the church, the church, the church is the body of Christ. It's the people of God, right? If he can destroy the church, he can scatter the sheep. If he can scatter the sheep, he's like a roaring lion that he can devour. Can you say amen? amen. I have to tell you that. Many, too many, live in the wreckage of a torn-up home. There are people that are standing in the ruins of church congregations because the devil got in, started dividing, disguising himself. We're righteous, we're righteous when you're really evil, when you're really evil. It's a strategy. The scavengers seem to continually circle looking for any form of life of a church that's rebuilding, of a family that's trying to restore what once was. The vulture is looking, trying to destroy. This is who we're fighting against. This is the tactic of the enemy. Now, with that being said, it's important, as I said a couple of weeks ago, to recognize that our battle is not just with the devil and the demonic. It's with the world, the flesh, and the devil and demonic. Ephesians chapter 2, you can read that when you get home. We'll give you insight into what I'm talking about. So here's a question. How do I know if it's the demonic that's attacking me? How do I know if my family is under assault right now? There's lots we could talk about, but I can give you three things that I think will help. You know it's the devil when my thoughts are not making sense. 
The things that I'm thinking about are absurd, illogical, and do not line up with my core values as a Christian. When those thoughts begin to come in saying, I hate my church. I hate my husband. I can't stand those kids, the enemies. Mm, mm. I can never, ever break free from this. I've been like this too long. That's absurd according to the word of God, isn't it? So when those thoughts come into us, it's not the world. It's not our own flesh. You don't think about yourself like that. The devil, the demonic comes in. Not making sense. My thoughts are all confused. They're all jumbled up. I don't know what's right and what's wrong. Demonic opposition. Second one is what I call out of the blue thoughts. Just all of a sudden flew in, boom. The Bible calls them fiery darts that he shoots, flames our mind. But those things that just come into our mind, you know, what happens if I just, next time she's mouthing off to me, I just sock her one. I just give her one right in the nose. That would make her shut up. Ridiculous, right? Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Out of the blue. Out of the blue. I wonder what would happen if I just kept on driving. Didn't stop. Left them behind. Left that job behind. Let them figure it out on Monday morning. I'm gone. I'm not coming back. Where'd that thought come from? Out of the blue thoughts. Third one is when the opposition to your life is strange and outrageous. Let me explain what I mean. You can't quite put your finger on it. Why is this happening now? Where did all this come from? We've been getting along so good. Where did this happen? What? Why did... The... And then it's just outrageous, outrageous. Battle, battle, battle. Here it is. Boom, boom, boom. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Strange and outrageous. You know it's not the world. The world is easy to identify when it's getting in. You, they, they, come, they, they show their colors pretty quick. Your flesh, you know, when you, you know when it's you. You know, hey, it's me. This is my carnality. It's my own personal lusts that are drawing me away from God. I, I get that. But when it's like, I don't even get this. I don't even know what's happening. It's outrageous. You can't even put your finger on it. I, I just want to make this very clear here. If you get your, 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 your money, your paycheck, you take all your money and you go spend it on clothes and travel and going out to eat, and then when it comes time to pay your rent and you don't have it, you don't go, man, the devil really got in there. <laughs> it wasn't the devil, was it? You know, we know that. It, 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 was, it was you. It was you. <laughs> right? But... You're a good steward. You've been giving. you saving. You're watching. You're doing your best. You're trying to move up, get a better job, work a little bit extra here. And all of a sudden, where did all these random expenses come from? Where did all this money that I haven't even spent it, where did it go? And I know where it went. Into the devil's hole. <laughs> the devil has a hole. And tries to put a lot of things that belong to you in there. So when the opposition is strange and outrageous, we know it's the demonic that's operative here. Now, just let me give you one good response when that happens. When these things start happening, you get these strange thoughts that are coming into your mind. Uh, You begin to get these random things happening. All of this starts to take place. The response should be, I rejoice that I've been so effective against the devil that he's intimidating me. That needs to be our response. Don't cower. Don't stay home. Don't, don't pretend. Don't, don't, none of that. Sit there and go, yeah, he's been tearing me up. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. That's an attitude. That's an attitude that we need to have. I'm going to close now, and I want to give you one last thing. 
And I'm not going to give you a solution or solutions. Next week, I'm going to try to give you some things that you can use to fight against what we've talked about today. But I need to leave you with one uh, extremely positive and important thought is that strength for the battle is only found in the Lord. It's only found in the Lord. Now, that may sound, many of you have been in church your whole life. You know all about church. You've heard every kind of sermon under the sun. You've had all different kinds of preachers talk to you and all of that. So you know all of this. Uh, But, you know, the trouble is, is we know it so much that sometimes we don't practice it. Sometimes we think, man, if I could just get another job, that would solve my problems. If I could just get away from her, man, just get away from her. If I could just get her to stop talking. I'd be all right. Man, if I could just get a place where I could sit on the beach, you know, and drink some pineapple juice and, you know, look at the sunset, you know, then that'd probably calm my spirit. Yeah, for seven to ten days, maybe. (laughs) Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's our strength, his power, his might. Psalms 18.39 says, For you equip me with strength for the battle. Oh, I love that. He says, You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, and those who hated me, I destroyed. (laughs) We like that part. Vengeance. (laughs) But the point being, my brother and my sister, and I want you to go home with this. Yeah, all what we talked about, the devil, don't ignore his tactics, the nature of the battle, the ferocity, the intensity that's there. Some people think, man, you're very animated. You know, you're always moving. You're so intense. You talk fast. You do all that. Okay, I want to tell you something. The devil's faster. <laughs> the devil's more intense. You think the preacher's intense. He's intense. He's, he's... And that's why... We've got to just stop. Let our strength come from God. Strength come from the Lord. It's a deadly battle, but it's not an unwinnable battle. It's a deadly battle, but it's not an unwinnable battle. Strength in the Lord. Give Jesus a hand clap of praise today. something a little different today. I want every person to stand to their feet, please. Please stand. World War II. In D-Day, D-Day is when the Allied troops left southern England, moved across the channel, and fought the most ferocious battle of um, the Allied Axis War. And as they went across, there was, before they went across actually, there were some people on the Allied side, our side, American, UK side, saying, hey, let's not go to that Normandy beaches there. Let's go around and fight the battle in Italy. We've been winning in Italy. We've been winning in Italy. Let's go, uh, one British politician said, let's go to the soft underbelly of the crocodile and defeat him that way. But it was decided amongst the military campaigners to go and attack them right on that beach. It's costly, man. It's costly. Hundreds, thousands of young men died in order to defeat the enemy. But one thing those military officials understood, and something I want you to understand today, is that if we were going to win in World War II, It was going to require everything that we had to defeat Hitler and the opposing German army, German armies. It's going to require everything you have to defeat the devil. And if you've caved into the devil a little bit more than you normally would, you're going to have to really fight to get out. You can, but I'm not going to make it sound like, hey, be strong in the Lord. Everything's cool. Hey, just be strong in Christ. Sing a few praise songs and a couple of prayers. You'll be good. 
No, you're going to have to recognize he's trying to defeat you. He's trying to defeat you, to destroy you, to divide you. And if you can recognize that, you can win. The question is, do you want to win? Now, if you want to win today, let's pray together as a people of God. And what I mean by that is I want you to step out of your chair and say, I want to win. Come stand up here. Because, because this, look it. I really view it like this. God's looking at this. God's looking at this. God's saying, I want to find out who's in the army, who really wants to win, who's playing church. And I'm not accusing you of that. I'm just saying he wants to see who's real, who's really willing to get into that ship and cross the channel and engage the enemy on a foreign beach, on a beachhead in your life maybe that you've never experienced before a newness and a freshness to experience God in a whole new way that's fitting for 2023. If that's you, I want you to come on up to the front. Come on up to the front today. Come on up to the front. If you're not quite understanding what I'm saying, but it feels good to you, come anyways, that's fine. If you think this is you, come, come. Again, if you don't want to come, that's entirely up to you. I respect you, love you, stand by you. But if it's you, come on. We come from a very violent place, Los Angeles, California, and there's lots of fights that take place and lots of little gangs and warfare that happens. Gracie, could this group take on a gang from a neighborhood? Easily, easily, easily. Easily, Grace might do it on her own, but we'll leave that one aside. That's a whole other thing that we shouldn't talk about in church. But my point being, we can do it. We can make a dent against the enemy in Manchester and Salford and England. We can. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm too old to play games. You know, I've been preaching too long to just say things. I want it to be real, and I believe what I'm saying. That we can do it. And if you believe it, we can do it. Let's start by giving God praise, a clap offering, lift your voice, shout, shout, shout. Yes, Lord. Glory, glory, glory. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb of God. We give you high praise. Jesus is Lord. The devil's defeated. The Lord is our King. We believe in you, Lord God. We trust in you. We thank you for the death on the cross and the power of your spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Almighty God, Almighty God, Almighty God, we call upon your name today and we ask God that you would empower us to take the battle to the enemy, that we would be like David uh, that was uh, fearless when he opposed uh, Goliath, uh, that the giants in our lives must be slain. They can come down, Lord God. Uh, Let that be in us. Let us have that faith and that confidence and that determination. Uh, God, let us always know that is by your grace, that is by your favor, that the weapons of our warfare are from you. They're not of our own strength. And God, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, Lord God. Uh, That we can defeat every opponent, Lord God. Uh, And we pray that we would look into the heavenly places. We would fight in the spiritual realm, Lord God. Uh, And for those who are in some intense firefights, God, I pray special covering over them, special blessing over them, uh, special favor over them, Lord God. God, have your way. God, have your way. God, have your way. Jesus, you are Lord of all. You're the Lord of the devil. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Thank you, God, today for your goodness. God, we pray for each individual person, the families they represent. 
God, their place in this world, the jobs that they work, the schools that they attend. Uh, let the light of Jesus be exemplified in those places, oh God. Uh, I pray, Lord, that Aspire Church, uh, God, as we rebuild, uh, as we pick up, that we could be a, a, a weapon in your uh, a tool, in your armory, Lord God, that we would be those kind of people, Lord, today. Lord, you know what we need and what we don't need. Give us only what we need, Lord God. Uh, Help us not to seek after those things that are of no value, Lord. Help us to only seek after those things uh, that have eternal significance. God, we love you today. We're praising you, God. Thank you. We walk out with protection, God, uh, covered with the full armor, Lord God, that we can withstand uh, in the evil day, God. Uh, We praise you and we worship you in Jesus' name. Give him high praise. One more clap offering. Stay right where you're at. Let me just give you my my pastor prayer here. Father, I pray over your people today, Lord God. I pray favor for them in this week, Lord God. Uh, We know that every week we gather together in your name and we pray, Lord, uh, as we engage the enemy uh, on other territory, in other places, in our homes, uh, in in our work, wherever, Lord, uh, be with us, be with us. I pray blessing, God, favor, equipment. Uh, God, you're able to bless us. We can be prosperous. We are rich in Christ, Lord God. Uh, We know that we can do these things, uh, and we just thank you, thank you, thank you. Let prosperity fall upon each and every person here today. Meet their needs uh, and bless them abundantly, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us today at Aspire Church. If the message today has blessed you or there's something we can help you with, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email to info at aspirechurch.co.uk. We meet in different locations throughout the week. And if you'd like to join us in person, we'd love to have you visit us. You can find all the details on our website at www.aspirechurch.co.uk. Or if you'd like further information, find us on Facebook, look us up on Twitter. We also live stream all of our services. And once again, if you'd like to view online, you can find all the details on our website. Thank you for joining us today, being part of our ministry. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. God bless you.